Yeah. So for me, it's um, good morning. I assume it's for you already good afternoon. Um, so I would like to take you through some ideas on, on, on treating pain in, 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 in neonates, which is, a, I think, a relevant topic, perhaps somewhat um, old uh, and established, but still would like to make, uh, to discuss with you, oh, just, okay, it does, doesn't matter. Um, I would like to take you through this time points throughout the lecture first, try to rebuild the case that it matters. I mean, um, we tend to forget this, but you have to realize that sometimes we should be aware that drugs have side effects or that analgesia may have side effects, but doing nothing is not a real option. And I would like to make this point uh, clear. So let's say the placebo is a nocebo, uh, and that's something that we should realize. Uh, as I assume that we all are more focused on pharmacology, we should also realize that prevention and non-pharmacological intervention also can really contribute to the level of comfort and, and, and analgesia and neonates. Um, if you consider uh, acetaminophen or paracetamol, I don't know how you call it in your side of the world. It's an old drug. There is a relatively new route of administration. Um, and we should not forget that this can also be an uh, of, of add-on benefit for minor and even severe uh, cases of pain. Maturational pharmacokinetics obviously matter uh, for any drug. So obviously also for energetic and sedative, that's also the case. Pharmacodynamic assessment, comfort and pain remains an issue in neonates. And finally, there are some new tools, some new drugs and new routes that can be considered. Um, and we will have highlight some aspects on that. So as I alluded to, my conflict of interest is I look at this from a point of clinical pharmacology. So avoiding painful procedures, pacifiers, sucrose, kangaroo care, this type of stuff. I honestly think that they are truly important. Um, but um, uh, I'm, I'm obviously more interested in, in, in the drug, drug ability aspects of, uh, of uh, this, uh, this uh, problem to handle. Um, and actually a few years ago, um, we, we, we were invited to go to Ghana for a PhD and actually they did a lot of work uh, all, despite the fact that didn't had that much resources. Uh, they did a lot of work on, on how to manage pain. So we should realize that the management of pain is mainly an approach that we should take as care providers uh, or caregivers. Um, so it's, it's a mentality, it's, it's, it's an approach to be taken and not so much time or, or, or money. So you, you can do it everywhere uh, if you have some resources. So uh, I thought that it was good also to instruct you a little bit on my languages that we use in our country, which is either Dutch or French. So I have one Dutch and one French slide in my presentation. And actually, this is, this is what sets over here is doing nothing is not an option because um, not treating pain will cause uh, harm uh, and will not go, go through the available literature, but I assume that you all are aware of the pivotal studies of Sonny and all um, and others that nicely illustrate that uh, the absence of energetics will result in increased mortality and morbidity. And I would like to restress that actually neonates are the only population where we have randomized controlled, placebo controlled data that uh, poor pain management does indeed re result in higher mortality. I'm not aware of any other human population that we have ever tried this. So this is something that we have to recall. But obviously, babies mature. And the way you uh, can look at that is simply pure anat anatomy. Uh, if a baby is admitted in your unit as a very preterm baby, the brain will have to grow. And the major part will actually happen on on your ward and du during uh, the time that your baby is on the ward. It's not only the anatomy, it's also function. And this is a slide that I commonly use for that because I felt that is a nice illustration on how things change over time. What you could nicely see over, I, perhaps I can use a pointer. Uh, pointer. So what you could nicely see over here is that uh, both excitation and inhibition type of uh, activities mature over time, uh, both in animal experiment setting as well as in the human setting. So that GABA and MDA and other 
uh, receptors actually will change over time. So this also means that, for instance, if you would give a benzodiazepine, which is the topic of the focus for GABA, that the effect of benzos may be a little bit different in preterm babies compared to term babies, not because of only the pharmacokinetics, but also from, because of the pharmacodynamics. If your receptor is working different, if your receptor is expressed more or less, or is more excitation versus inhibition type of activities, then you can have a different uh, pattern uh, or different type of effects. If you try to um, walk through the uh, neuroanatomy based on what we know and the neuroanatomy of pain, actually all systems are in place from at least 24 weeks onwards. We have sensory receptors already there. The dorsal and horn is already there and the thalamocortical uh, connection is made somewhere in 20, 22, 23, 24 weeks. So this means that at that time, the signal from the thalamus will go to the cortex and this can be defined as a pain uh, uh, perception or at least a nociceptive signal can go through. And also if you consider biochemical uh, expressions, actually the full system is there. The only thing which is not there is um, the descending uh, patterns. So in general, we have a brain system where you, if you have a, a, an input, for instance, pain to the brain that actually have a descending signal to, to blunt a little bit direction while these blunting descending pathways are less expressed in preterm and term babies. So, so it takes in the first year. So this means actually that the anatomy is there. And if um, a preterm baby is even more likely that he or she will feign, will feel pain more pronounced compared to uh, another baby. It's even so for fentanyl and uh, it's even so for the fetus, sorry. Uh, and this is actually a very nice study where they studied fetuses who were receiving at that time uh, an intrahepatic um, needle to have an, a, a trend, blood transfusion. At, con, at contemporary, it's more commonly done by, by the umbilical cord. But anytime, anyhow, at that time, they did it by uh, uh, so transabdominal puncture. And the, the funny thing of this study is that actually they tried to assess the stress response in these fetuses while transfusing. So this is a paired study as these babies may need repeated uh, administration. And one time they get the dose of fentanyl and the other time they did not. And actually what I could nicely show is that um, uh, that the stress response based on some stress hormones was much more blunted in those who received fentanyl. So even in fetal life, you can at least have also the, the stress response. Um, I assume that those of you who commonly use fentanyl will have a major impression of 10 microgram per kilogram, but you have to realize that the fetus is in a whole different ball game because actually the way you have to look at it is that the fetus is on a continuous hemofiltration and a conti continuous hepatic filtration by the placenta. So actually whatever you inject in the baby or in the fetus, it may actually be cleared much faster, not so much because of the fetus, but back by placenta back to the mother. So these doses are not to be used in uh, postnatal life, obviously. And another aspect is also that the developmental pain uh, also has to do with receptive fields. You, I assume you all have your basic anatomy and you know that uh, uh, you have these receptive fields. Well, the basic uh, message over here is that this major overlap in these uh, fields in a preterm and a term baby. So this means that you may have much more cross uh, reaction so that uh, the, the dermatomes or the receptive fields are not that much or that well uh, dis discriminated uh, in early neonatal life. And this is simply because actually you have still cross connections at the spinal level. And this is just one uh, anim animal experimental uh, study to show this. This is um, a study which shows actually uh, the, the, the impact on expression of uh, a specific indicator of, of uh, painful stimuli. And what you could nicely see, this is a rat model where actually they did exactly the same study in a rat of uh, at term 
uh, at, at, at birth at seven days and 14 days just to compare to the human setting. And actually what I did is inject with Freud that you found one of the legs of the animal, which doesn't sound nice and actually it results in something like an arthritis type of pain. So persistent prolonged type of pain. And if you would do this in a fully uh, term animal, you would have one signal at the spinal level, at the level where this leg goes, the, the, neuro is, the, the neuron is connected to the spinal cord at a given place, and then you will have an upregulation up of this uh, biomarker at this level. But in a young animal, it's much more diffuse because of this cross connections and actually even at the contralateral side. So actually what this shows again is that the pain system already is effective and actually it is much more diffuse response if you do this in an immature animal. And just to summarize what we know on, um, uh, on, on, on pain management and its relevance in neonates is that as I alluded to, I assume we all know the, 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 the pivotal study of uh, Sonny Anand, uh, who actually nicely illustrated that uh, PDA ligation uh, with or without opioids, in addition to uh, neuromuscular relaxants, um, he nicely showed in this study, but was terminated preterminally uh, pre because of uh, difference in outcome, that the mortality was higher and the morbidity was higher in the group of babies who were not treated with opioids. So in this way, he nicely illustrated. But also minor pain models like circumcision. Uh, Anatadio nicely illustrated that circumcision actually resulted in um, uh, circumcision without analgesia resulted in prolonged dur duration of crying and pro prolonged pain scores at immunization. So this actually learns you that circumcision, which was commonly done uh, at, at birth actually, and vaccination two, three or four months later onwards, it nicely illustrates that actually the impact of pain can also be quantified months afterwards. So this is what was my first bullet point. We should not forget that doing nothing is not a good option. Uh, so that pain uh, management is a relevant uh, aspect of neonatal intensive care. And that in its absence, you have what you can call a nocebo effect. Second part, and as I said, <clears throat> I promise to give you two slides on my two languages that we use in our country. It's better to prevent than to cure. Uh, so, as I alluded to, a lot of preventive uh, measurements can be done, and they, there's a plenty uh, of, of illustrations, and this is just one. When I started my training, I had to use this type of weapon for a heel stick um, uh, to collect good tree. Uh, or other blood samples in these babies. And it's quite obvious that also the equipment and the methods that you use uh, do improve outcome. And the same holds true for fixation, um, feed and scan during MRI compared to sedate, to over sedate the baby. So these are my first two bullet points. And now let's go to uh, some uh, drug things. And this is the acetaminophen or the paracetamol dosing uh, suggestions that we um, uh, use in our side of the world. So this is a Dutch formulary for oral, rectal, and intravenous administration. I'm not sure to what extent uh, the rectal route is used in your region of the world. It sounds a little bit weird perhaps, but in the, in the in the Netherlands, it's a quite popular and commonly route and, and accepted route, but I understood that for the rest of the world, this is a route which, uh, which is in generally uh, avoided. Uh, but the point that I would like to make is that we suggest to consider loading doses, and I will try to explain this. And the maintenance doses um, also in part depend on the route of administration, simply to try to uh, adapt for the difference in the bioavailability or biodisponibility. Um, and these, these are data in children, but the same type of data actually exists also in neonates and have been generated by uh, Richard van, uh, van Lingen as part of his uh, PhD work. But this is, um, these are uh, data that um, have been generated in children after ENT surgery by Brian Anderson, already late last century. 
but I still like them because what they did in ENT children is these children received a single dose of acetaminophen either by rectal or by oral route and then they checked for concentrations over time. Uh, both were treated with exactly the same uh, dose so what you can actually ni very nicely see is that um, the concentrations reached following rectal administration are much more lower blunted so that's one but this is something that you can calculate obviously that's not rocket science it's about 50 percent but even much more important there's quite some extensive variability and this makes it quite difficult to use the rectal route because this variability makes predictability somewhat difficult. So this means that actually you do not fully compensate. Perhaps I have to go back one slide to show it. You do not fully compensate for the fact that about 50% get lost if you compare rectal to oral route, because if you would do so, you have technically the risk that's oh, I messed up. Technically the risk that you will end up with some cases with too high acetaminophen exposure. So what this slide shows is actually three things. Yes, by this biodisponibility or bioavailability difference between the different routes. Second, there's much more variability and the pattern is much more blunted following rectal administration. And you can only partially compensate for the average difference because there is quite some inter-individual variability and limited predictability. Having said that, the good news is that following available data in, uh, in adults and in children, it has been nicely shown that you can have an opioid sparing effect uh, uh, when paracetamol, uh, paracetamol is co-administered in a setting of non-cardiac surgery. These are data which have been generated uh, uh, in, uh, in Rotterdam. And uh, you have to be very careful because if you read the paper, it's a little bit more difficult to, to understand. But what they did is in non-cardiac surgic cases, these babies received a loading dose of morphine before discharge from the, from, from the surgical, uh, from, from the operating theater. Um, and then the babies were treated with uh, paracetamol or with placebo and morphine was used as a backup. Uh, based on pain assessment and actually a relevant group of babies never were treated with morphine and only went well with paracetamol alone afterwards but uh, the way they marketed it says they claim that they have reduced 66 percent of morphine exposure and that's correct but then it's only for the morphine uh, maintenance dose and not from uh, for the loading dose because all the babies were treated with 100 uh, micrograms uh, before discharge from the operating theater. But it does work. So it's opioid sparing following non cardiac surgery. And they're currently are conducting, perhaps they just finalized, I have to ask. Um, and they're conducting a similar type of study in cardiac cases. And I assume that the results will be rather similar, but perhaps for hemodynamics and tolerance, it may be interesting to have another look. And it also works for minor pain syndromes. Uh, this is what uh, we have uh, done in babies admitted with bruising and this type of stuff, you, you know, the usable stuff. We're able to show that indeed pain scores go down after the initial loading dose and they come back after six hours, which is similar uh, as in other studies. What's important to realize, and actually I get a little bit frustrated by reading quite some papers who try to assess the impact of uh, acetaminophen for procedural pain, that uh, the common procedural pain models that they use, like heel, heel stick or, uh, or screen for ROP, that, that acetaminophen obviously, in my opinion, doesn't work. We neither take acetaminophen before we have a... Uh, uh, an injection or before we have any uh, surgical intervention. So um, you have to know how a drug works. Uh, so I'm a little bit frustrated that still so quite some studies are done uh, for, the, for to assess the impact of acetaminophen for procedural pain in newborns. If it doesn't work in children and in adults, I assume it's reasonable to anticipate that we'll need to work in, in, in newborns. So uh, for acetaminophen, the route of administration matters. It's opioid sparing. It can be as monotherapy for minor pain syndromes, uh, but it doesn't work for procedural pain. That's my main message. 
And so if we go to the, the more potent ones, I would like to illustrate a little bit the relevance of uh, pharmacokinetics and maturation of pharmacokinetics for these uh, new, newer drugs. And my first message is please consider loading those because of the characteristics of these babies in general, uh, elimination half-lives are much longer in, in babies because distribution volume is higher and clearance is lower. This means that it takes much more time before you get on steady state. Um, and this has to be, has to, uh, is associated with, uh, this, uh, this one doesn't work, but this is more for people who do not know what distribution is to illustrate, but that, that's okay. I assume that you are on the field on that. Uh, and these differences in body composition are mainly driven by the fact that babies uh, are mainly based on uh, have a much higher body wa uh, water content. So this means that it will drive uh, changes. So this means that loading doses are actually in my opinion, if they matter in human life, they will be most relevant in newborns. And uh, you have to consider this because uh, whether you use more fine fentanyl or any other energetic, um, if you don't use loading dose, it will take the longest time in newborns before they are on, 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 concent uh, on the concentration level uh, uh, in for. Um, and what I have commonly seen in my units is that if you do not give a loading dose, actually um, you're on then on the lower black line and assuming that this is the, the therapeutic range that you have to aim for, that nurses come and say, well, this baby is not comfortable yet. And then you simply raise uh, the continuous administration and then actually you end up 12 or 24 or 36 hours later onwards, you, you, you end up with an over sedated child. So this loading dose, in my opinion, is a very important part of, uh, of good uh, pharmaco practices in these babies. And this is not an illustration, but this is for uh, acetaminophen for paracetamol. Um, in a typical baby, uh, where if you would not give a loading dose, then it actually takes up to 18 hours before you're on the, on the target for acetaminophen. If you go the loading dose, which uh, which we generally use is 20 milligram per kilogram, then actually you're on this target from the begin onwards. And the energetic effectivity that I've shown for minor uh, intervention actually as is related to this, uh, this loading dose. So we have established quite some experience with that and have repeatedly proven that this is well tolerated from a hemodynamic point of view, well tolerated from a hepatic point of view. So there seems no, no acute toxicity. A recent paper that I would like to discuss with you is this one, because this was for me an eye opener. This is work of um, uh, on, on fentanyl pharmacokinetics with specific focus on extreme preterm babies. And we are currently trying to merge it with term babies into, uh, in an attempt to get more, um, more complete pictures. So what you can see over here in the this is from 24 to 32 weeks. And this is the clearance and this is postnatal age. Um, and actually, I was quite impressed by the fact that it seems to be that fentanyl clearance explodes to a certain extent from birth onwards and will increase dramatically over the first week of postnatal life, irrespective, to a certain extent, driven by the extent of immaturity, but irrespective of its immaturity. Um, so this means, uh, when I read this paper uh, for the first time, this means that we have what we have classified as, as tolerance in these cases actually may simply be developmental pharmacokinetics, maturational pharmacokinetics. So if you model <coughs> this concept to a continuous infusion of my, my, one microgram per kilogram per hour, over, uh, hour over 10 days, you can actually nicely see that there is a uh, significant impact over time um, of these, um, of these uh, difference in, in clearance. So the fact that if you use fentanyl, you have to increase the dose after, after say two, three, four, five days, you should realize that this do, does not necessarily reflect tolerance, but it can actually simply reflect the fact that this baby has learned to clear, to clear, to clear this drug more effective. So that the overall exposure is, has been uh, reduced. Obviously, as we all are faced with um, assessment, pain assessment, or but the same holds true for sedation, remains an important issue in preverbal uh, children. 
uh, because what we are really interested in is treating pain uh, and nociception. What you can have a look at is pain behavior and pain expression. So this is not the same. And we can learn with each other to use a pain score and le learn to look at the very same way to these aspects and, uh, and try to interpret it to what extent this pain behavior does reflect nociception. But from a scientific point of view, if we are honest, this means that we may actually learn each other to learn in the wrong direction, to look in the wrong direction. Uh, so as technically all these pain scores, which have undergone validation uh, have major limitations and uh, it's good news that I think it's from Oxford group is working hard actually to to develop EEG type of signals for pain but again it's a mainly in procedural pain and heel stick is not the same as uh, let's say a necrotizing enterocolitis child as a post-surgical child but anyhow uh, I still felt that this type of uh, data is actually very interesting to to notice um, because it does illustrate again the complexity and the developmental aspect of pain expression. Uh, what you can see over here is a, is a merged uh, data set from this Oxford group. Uh, you can see over here gestational age uh, and the number of cases and what they have done in, done in blue and red if I think I'm, I'm a Dalton. Uh, but uh, so what they did in all these studies is either innoxious or noxious stimuli provide a noxious or non-noxious and innoxious stimuli. And what you could nicely see is actually facial grimace is very well discriminated in, uh, in term cases, but in these extreme preterm cases, it's quite difficult to discriminate a noxious from an innoxious stimuli. So again, it's very nicely and uh, to a certain extent painfully illustrate that we as care providers still have a major issue to discriminate pain from other expressions in, in an extreme preterm baby. So we should uh, still realize this. I'm not sure how to handle this. Uh, at present, it seems to be that again, EEG signaling may be um, one of the promises approaches to get out of these uh, problems. So my last part is, um, is more what if you think about uh, uh, out of the box. And one of the things that struck me actually already for more than a decade is that if you look at this, what we miss is uh, NSAIDs. And um, I started my, my research on, 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 uh, with the PhD on neonatal pain. And actually already at that time we discussed because I had some stuff on ibuprofen but obviously related to PDA treatment. Um, uh, we already started to discuss, well, shouldn't we consider this as uh, an energetic? Um, and this is something, <coughs> sorry, that uh, we should not forget. And these are data in adults. So let there be no doubt, but this is the number needed to treat after surgery for pain reduction. And we all believe that morphine is a terribly strong energetic but actually, if we look at it, NSAIDs are also very effective energetics after surgery or after trauma. And uh, I usually say that surgery is um, legally accepted trauma uh, because what a surgeon does is create a trauma to try to solve a problem. Um, um, so in this way, perhaps we should dare to think about specific settings where we consider NSAIDs as an energetic. I'm aware of one study which will start, uh, will, which will try to assess ibuprofen as an energetic uh, during procedural screen for retinopathy of prematurity. But still, I have to be, I have to confess, quote unquote, that we have used this energetic short times, two, three days with close monitoring and diuresis and weight gains, for instance, in highly inflammation type of uh, uh, um, uh, wounds or issues. Uh, to try to assist in, in newborns. And in these specific cases, we had the impression that was sufficiently effective, but we need more studies. So if you have young people who want to do something in neonatal life and want to change something, this may be one of the ideas. Yes, we have new drugs. We have remifentanil, but we have Dexmet, but, and there's even one new one, which you may not no, but actually midazolam also has a short-acting one, Remi. Uh, Remi midazolam or Remi mazolam. 
and has been recently reg registered by FDA and also by the Chinese authorities for procedural sedation in adults. So data are coming out and actually the, the interesting part on Remy fentanyl and Remy mazolam is that clearance is very fast. So you have a very fast on and off phenomenon for this drug, which may make it interesting uh, for instance, for procedural sedation. So we do not know that much yet on this drug, but as I alluded to, Rimifentanil is a very short acting opioid uh, with accumulating experiences in, in neonates. Uh, it seems to be that it's therefore sh sh suited for short procedural uh, sedation, like for instance, insure, but the data that we have for uh, during insure for intubation is that chest rigidity is quite uh, common. So I know that my Dutch colleagues tried to do this drug because when we uh, started our research on intubation, we actually decided that uh, Rotterdam would do the remifentanil and Leuven would do the propofol. And then when we have the PK data, we would proceed to have a head-to-head -head type of comparison. But actually, we never proceeded because they had such a high incidence of chest rigidity in this specific setting. Uh, in their uh, remifentanil that uh, that they stopped their study and were also reported on that. Uh, it has a fast onset and a subsequent fast disappearance, uh, but you have to realize that this is by definition associated with uh, faster appearing tolerance. A phenomenon of hyperalgesia has been reported in, um, in children and adults, and I'm aware of one case report, I think it's in British Journal of Anesthesia, British Journal of Clinical Pharmacology on hyperalgesia, also an extreme preterm infant. Uh, and you should be aware of the potential risk of chest rigidity. There's one study who used it in uh, ventilated cases for a relatively short period of time and they were comfortable with, uh, with it. Uh, and so this is an overview on what I was able to retrieve on um, uh, intubation practices, and you see there's some various variances in, 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 in dosing and ED effective dose seeking. Um, but actually the basic, uh, and this has just been published last week, the basic issue is we're still not all out of the wood. What the hell would we have to use uh, if we feel that we need analgesia or sedation newborn infants is in an opioid or should we shift to dexmet or clonidin, so the alpha-2 uh, agonists. Uh, so there is another uh, systematic review who has uh, scheduled to, to be conducted. And uh, uh, I'm quite confident that this uh, systematic review will need to provide all solutions. But actually the good news of the systematic reviews is that they besides randomized control trials, will also collect data on pharmacokinetics indications and more variability and including also safety aspects. So things are evolving, but I'm not sure um, uh, what should be the preference. Uh, um, we can also, and this way I shift a little bit, not only on compounds, but also on route of administration. Uh, you know, I assume, we all know that Dexmet is a little bit the new kit of the block and very promising uh, because it's claimed, and there are some robust animal experimental data on that, it's claimed to be neuroprotective. So for instance, in cases with hypothermia and asphyxia, but also during surgery, it may have some advantages compared to other um, uh, interventions. But you have to realize that the main uh, aspect where Dexmet is used in say non-neonatal settings is that it will improve what's called the natural sleep. So this means that these children or adults will get easier awake, uh, which is perhaps a little bit cumbersome in our neonatal setting. Anyhow, there are not much data on uh, its use, but for internasal, I could find um, two, two papers. Um, uh, or I'm aware of two papers where Dexmet was used in an Italian setting in one uh, Italian unit where uh, former preterms were scanned at term equivalent age for MRI and at a given time they switched to a, something like a prophylactic Dexmet 
uh, administration and they uh, following this shift they needed much less midazolam to end up with an effective uh, MRI uh, data collection so what they used was a three microgram per kilogram intranasal single dose of uh, dexmedotidine and the same holds true for this type of study where they actually compared dexmed to chloralidrate uh, but this is uh, in infants and toddlers, so it's not only uh, neonates. Um, so they, this, as, with a similar dose, they were able to show that they were able to fi finalize their uh, uh, cardiac ultrasounds as effective as uh, with chloralidrate. And actually, last week I had to review a paper from uh, Iran where they formulated chloralidrate also for internasal administration. So I think that. Um, additional creativity for different type of drugs and different type of routes may be indeed uh, an interesting next step. Uh, so Dexmet, I think it holds the promise to become one of the useful compounds. Data accumulating uh, and, and colleagues are reporting their experience. So uh, my main message of today would be that if you use this drug, please report on it. Uh, collect data and, and, and try to compare perhaps not in the cleanest way, but at least generate data that can be used for uh, at least power calculations or provide some data on safety and tolerance. As I already alluded to, it's claimed to be neuroprotective. So in asphyxia cases, there is recently also a pharmacokinetic study in cases, uh, whole body uh, uh, cooling cases. So uh, because it's perceived to be neuroprotective and in anesthesia, but this is rather in infants. There is an ongoing initiative throughout the world, mainly guided by pediatric anesthesiology, but also in your side of the world. Uh, it's called the T-Rex study, where they try to compare uh, uh, general anesthesia. Pro well, for, for major surgery type of interventions, they try to quantify the potential protective effect of uh, uh, a dosing regime, including dex uh, dexmedotidine to uh, conventional uh, anesthesia techniques. Um, <clears throat> this uh, concept actually further builds on the GAS study. I'm not sure if you know this study, but in the GAS study, they they uh, compared general anesthesia versus uh, local anesthesia for inguinal repair in infants uh, with the primary outcome, the neurocognitive assessment at the age of eight. I think they already have report on data at two years and five years, and it seems not to be any differences. But the major comment that I received on this is that the GAS study, which is inguinal repair, is a short lasting, study, uh, last, uh, lasting intervention. And now they're focusing on really the bigger urogenital type of surgery, intestinal surgery, so the, the, the long lasting uh, interventions. I already have provided some ideas on other routes of administrations uh, because it's perceived to be more convenient, less invasive. Um, it will avoid the first pass metabolism and this can be either an advantage or a disadvantage. It depends a little bit on if you, for instance, would still go for codeine, it would be a disadvantage that you'd avoid first pass metabolism, but in, in essence, uh, it may actually reduce also systemic side effects. So the root administration can be of, of, of assistance. And besides uh, nasal, you can also consider sublingual or, or uh, buccal administration. Uh, I'm not sure, I assume, but at least in Europe, bucolam, which is uh, buccal uh, midazolam, is a registered product, but actually for seizures in children. So it's midazolam ready-made for buccal administration. <clears throat> but I checked yesterday and actually could find very limited, if any, data on uh, the use of sublingual or buccal uh, routes of administration neonates with uh, quantifying uh, the, the, the impact. Uh, I do have some personal experiences uh, with, uh, with Dexmet and fentanyl in, um, in, in somewhat bigger children where we commonly use this uh, nostril or this mucosal atomizer device. Uh, because one of the setbacks, if you inject a little bit of fluid in the, na in the nasal cavity, is that uh, it has to be uh, at best as a spray. And this uh, equipment actually provides this. But actually, I checked yesterday on the available evidence. And I could only find one study where they compared the, uh, 
the device compared to the routine fluid in children for sedation for imaging type of techniques and actually they were not able to show any differences in uh, sedation duration and time until sedation between both uh, routes of administration. If you use the nasal route, there are different hypotheses. You can actually have the transport either transcellular or um, uh, or uh, by the side route, or some also claim that by the olfactory uh, nerve system, you have a faster uh, access to the brain. But anyhow, it has been uh, uh, used and it is a, a, a growing field of interest uh, that instead of intravenous administration, we can actually consider other routes of administration. But it's similar to the rectal uh, administration of earlier during the lecture, you have to consider that you will end up with some more uh, uh, variability and bioavailability. So what we have as data is rel relatively limited. We have some study uh, from the French group who compared nasal midazolam to ketamine uh, for neonatal intubation in the delivery room, so early neonatal life. And actually what they were able to show that in their hands, midazolam was um, a little bit more effective uh, defined as feasibility to proceed to intubation, uh, but both were tolerated rather well. I'm not sure if you ever have tried this yourself, um, but it hurts. Um, so you have to realize that the most common adverse effect reported following intranasal midazolam is that you end up with a burning irritation feeling of the nasal mucosa and followed by a bitter taste in the mouth. For those who are more into pharmacy, they know that uh, taste masking of midazolam is, uh, is not so easy uh, in, in, in syrups. Uh, and this is a major setback. And I actually do not know why it is the case, but I happen to know that the same holds true for the Remi misolam that I have suggested in one of my former slides. So because the Remi midazolam is, uh, provided in, in vials, powder vials, and the FDA asked for uh, assessment on, on, on uh, abuse. Uh, and so they asked some volunteers to inhale the, the powder and actually they also complained a lot about the burning pain in the nose. Uh, so, uh, and that does result in some sedation, obviously. Um, so because of this uh, perceived risk, we learned on that. And actually we also tried to develop a formulation for children because it would be great if you give, could give a short acting type of sedation type of drug by the nose. But uh, until now we also failed to get rid of this uh, painful uh, stimuli. And it feels a little bit contradicting to use a drug which has results in major discomfort in some of the children to end up with sedation. So that's something that I really would like to stress. And there are some data also on the intranasal diamorphin in, in children. Uh, and obviously it does result um, in a different uh, plasma pattern, but it does result, result in good effective sedation um, because the dose that you have to administer is relatively uh, more, more limited. So these were actually the points that I would like, that I wanted to discuss with you. Um, so I simply repeating, um, I really felt that I had to start with building the claim again that pain is a relevant issue and doing nothing is not an option. Prevention, non-pharmacological intervention I only touched on briefly, but they are important if you want to build a, 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 a comfort or explore comfort uh, intervention in your unit. Acetaminophen or paracetamol is no drug, but it has its merits. Pharmacokinetic uh, matters, obviously, and maturational aspects even matters more in neonates. PD assessment remains a problem, and we do have new tools and new routes of administration. And I hope that if I only manage to have to, to stimulate one young emerging colleague to do something on this field, I would already be very happy with this lecture. Thank you and happy to take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, I'm sure there are lots of um, hot young brains here who will be uh, contacting you for a research project. Um, well, they can I'll, do it on I... myself. I'm happy with it. 
<laughs> Put them on the spot. Okay, I'll pass the question answer time to Srini because uh, you guys are part of the same gang. So over to you, Srini. Uh, yes, you've unmuted yourself. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Carol, for an excellent presentation as usual. Um, so I, before we open the session to the rest of the audience here in the Zoom conference, I think let me go through the questions here on the side. Many of them are coming actually from me and uh, <laughs> so sorry, I, sorry, I couldn't see them yet. So yeah, that's okay. Can read them. So yeah. what what we want to know? One question is: Do you use the same preparation of paracetamol for oral and rectal? No, no. In our setting, it's not the case because uh, you you have uh, and actually it's a good question because the the way the formulation is provided for rectal administration also affects the bioavailability. We have uh, commercially available uh, subs, uh, so the, the the most commonly used are glycerin type of subs, and you have them in the very different type of concentration. So we have some dose flexibility in our part of the world because it's it's a common uh, commonly used route of administration in in the Netherlands and to a certain extent in Belgium. But actually, I worked hard the last decade to get rid of this uh, rectal administration, or to reduce the rectal administration, and to promote oral administration uh, as soon as reasonably possible, uh, mm -hmm. also in newborn. So, but uh, because of the market, we do have uh, commercially available formulations. Uh, yeah, uh, like Michelle, one of our pharmacists in the group, she's there and she's in the meeting now. Uh, I don't know if she can unmute herself and if she can answer for the group whether we have any rectal preparation in Australia and New Zealand. I think we are using the same. I think maybe the oral one, probably the same one using rectally. I think Michelle hasn't got access to a speaker, okay. Shridi. Okay, yeah. that's all right. Next question, Carol, is about a topical preparation like EMLA. Uh, mm -hmm. is, it, is it safe to use in a term and preterm babies? And also, does it work for heel prick? Well, the um, I, I had I have some slides on that, but I uh, eliminated them. Um, I, I think if, if you try to summarize the current European approach on that, it's perceived to be used very carefully in preterm babies because of, uh, I have, <laughs> have a slide with the Smurfs of the shrooms. I don't know how they're called in your country. The blue things, they actually haven't been invented in Belgium. Um, so I generally use this picture to, to say, be careful for methemoglobinemia in preterm babies. Um, and if you really do the head-to-head the -head comparisons, uh, the add-on benefit for heel stick is very limited. So if you use sucrose um, or, 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 or human milk uh, and suction uh, or, or, or pacifier in addition to uh, EMLA, the add-on benefit of EMLA or, or, or a similar product is very limited. So I'm, I'm uh, reluctant to do that. There are some data also on lumbar puncture. Um, and that it has proven to be some data suggests that it is effective, but it's it's not the major breakthrough. It and whenever you use it, you should restrict it. You should clean afterwards, and um, uh, you should be careful in preterm babies. That's how I assess literature. Thanks, Carol. And I just got a reply from Michelle has uh, typed in there. There is a paracetamol suppository available in Australia, but currently not available. There are yeah. some preparations. Well, that's, yeah. that's, that's what I alluded to. It's a, it's a market issue. Yeah. It exists in the world, but um, I assume that in your setting, it would be only very rarely used. And for instance, in babies with esophageal issues or whatsoever, that you would consider to use this route as, as, as an exceptional route. But it, whatever you would take a training in the Netherlands, it's actually, it's a routine route. So I, I it's, it's a little bit, uh, they are, uh, but I still, again, I didn't want to make the case for rectal administration. I wanted to make the case that be careful, be real, do realize that's quite some variability um, on absorption. 
uh, with the rectal roots. So uh, my advice, and we work quite hard actually in Belgium to get rid of this uh, uh, practice and to switch to oral administration, uh, claiming the benefit that actually does also provide much more dose flexibility because if you have a side you can give whatever you want. If you have pre-built subs, as we have in our country, you, you will have to give 80 or 110 or, or, or whatsoever. And then there's a the practice to cut these in two, um, but that doesn't work either. So my main uh, idea was, yes, we have some experience with that, but actually we try to shift to other formulations. So Julie, I'm just looking at, I'm looking for, there are no further questions in the group chat here. No. Can I can I just ask Carol while we are <laughs> waiting for a, a few more questions to pop up? Do you have uh, any experience on remifentanil at the moment in your unit? Like, do you use it uh, for yes. uh, mist and uh, yeah? Well, we don't use it for mist because, as I alluded to, the chest rigidity is really tricky. Yeah. Um, I think I, I talked about it in uh, my lecture on neonatal intubation. I never believed that it exists. Yeah. I thought it was a invented problem for people who cannot intubate until I get the issue and two in the morning <laughs> with a yeah. child with chest rigidity. So it exists and it's much more common with Remy. I assume that also has to do how you how you give it. If you give a really bolus or you simply start the infusion. Um, but this is just a hypothesis. Um, but um, <clears throat> but we use it for short surgery, but this has to do with how we organize our care. Like for instance, for retinal surgery, the babies are sur uh, undergo surgery on the ward. So what we do is actually we, we, we give them an IV access. We give them um, a bolus of propofol for intubation because we intubate these children. Then we start the Remy um, uh, perf uh, infusion throughout surgery. And at the end of surgery, we stop and actually uh, before surgery, we give the first those bolus of uh, acetaminophen um, uh, with the intention to have comfort after the surgery in this baby. So we use it, but only for this short time of uh, type of interventions. Uh, right. uh, of instance, chest tube removal type of stuff that you think, okay, this is a very uh, specific setting. So yeah. it, it, has it has been hyped a lot. Yeah. Also in non-neonates, but actually, I think the enthusiasm is 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 weaning a little bit. Uh, yeah. This. So we have a supplement question on this. What sedation do you use for a Lisa or mist in that case? Oh well, we um, we we use a low dose of uh, propofol, so one milligram per kilogram of propofol. But uh, I understood that, um, and I think another aspect related to that is that we use uh, video laryngoscopy. And I, right. uh, uh, I, there is not much evidence uh, on that, but at least um, the way I feel it and perceive how things have evolved, that also, again, the techniques that you use and the equipment that you use may also actually major uh, impacts on, on, on the stress induced in the baby. So I, I, uh, I became a strong believer. I'm not sure if this is scientifically the best wording. Uh, but I, I truly believe that <coughs> equipment is of relevance on that. So we give a low dose of propofol uh, right. combined with, uh, with uh, technical adaptations. We have two more questions on remifentanil. Does, mm -hmm. a slow, does a slow infusion of remifentanil over three to five minutes reduce the risk of chest rigidity? Also, that's what I understood. Yeah, that's okay. what I understood from uh, from pediatric anesthesiologist, but I'm not aware of any data um, published on neonates. As I alluded to, it's the, it's a paper uh, where Sino Simons was involved. Uh, they tried to use this compound for uh, for intubation in in the Netherlands, but what they gave was really an IV bolus shot. And they ended up with the high incidence of chest rigidity. I forgot the figure, but it was 30, 40%. So they stopped right. the study. So there is some rational around it, but I'm not aware of data and newborns. And the other question uh, similar to the uh, next one is, is the incidence of chest rigidity similar between remifentanil and fentanyl? Um, based on my experience, remifentanil, you rarely see it, which is 
one two percent of cases max. With anemia fentanyl, if you go for bolus, it seems to be more common. Right, and if uh, at all you see chest rigid chest wall rigidity, what do you do? How do you manage? That was another question. <laughs> just well, the, well, the, the, I think it's it's important to mention. Uh, so be, because people have to be aware on that that really exists. So that's the reason that I also mentioned in, in this lecture. Uh, and then we, 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 we give a, uh, uh, we recently checked, we give tracrium now instead of uh, uh, puncuronium. Uh, so we, yeah, then we give a, a muscular relaxant. But for remifentanil, you have to be terribly careful because you can be terribly impolite to the child. Right. <laughs> because you will end up with uh, muscular polarization without any analgesia. I'm, I'm happy to tell you one funny, it's, it's not funny, but that's what happens in units. Uh, one of the babies, when we use remifentanil um, uh, after, uh, for uh, AROP surgery, um, there was still some of the drug left in the peripheral effusion. And actually our nurse flushed the system. Uh, and so the child went out, stopped to breathe and, and was fully sedated. Um, and actually what we did at that time was we thought, okay, this will not take for a long time. We will not uh, go for antagonizing or we'll not go for paralyzing, but simply try to take the baby on, uh, on, on back um, uh, ventilation. Actually, the baby recuperated within two minutes, but uh, you have to be careful of this type of stuff. I, I agree. And uh, Raji was asking, is there any role for an analog zone if we see chest wall rigidity? Um, Technically, it could be, but it will not solve your problem because if you want, I assume that if you want to intubate that the baby needs this intubation. Uh, so naloxone will, can be part of the solution, but it will be only a symptomatic solution because at that time you still want to have yeah. your tube in. Yeah, so yeah. that's, but that's more pragmatic from my point of view. Um, <clears throat> so I, I assume that technically it can, but it will not solve your initial aim, which was get the tube in. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Carol. And we well, have- that's, uh, that's what I meant if you have a short acting one yeah. and you give, uh, you have to give uh, additional muscular paralysis, be aware that the child will be awake, perhaps not visually, but that still uh, and the central nervous system will be awake in the next minute. We have another question from Akash. What sedation do you recommend for PPHN if needed? Uh, well, what we, we, well, depends a little bit um, in, in, in um, I think that's one, of, that's one of the problems that we have a lot of stuff and people have to learn a little bit. I think it's better to make some drugs that you really have, get to know as a unit because it's not the doctors, it's not the pharmacist who really know the drug, it's the nurse who knows how things work, uh, really work. Um, so having said that, um, in Leuven, we generally use fentanyl um, and if needed, minor additional doses of uh, midazolam. In Rotterdam, we commonly use morphine, but in PPN in cases, we also tend to go for fentanyl. But that, that, that's about it. Uh, I'm not sure, perhaps the colleague can comment on, on, on that, on, on why, how she, he or she looks at uh, 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 what she use or he uses. Yeah. And one last question. Does the administration of sedation slow the resuscitation process that is longer time to secure an airway? Well, that's, yeah, that's a, a, a common discussion that we have in the delivery room eh, where you say, well, you, you don't need any sedation over yeah. there um, because you, you may need to have the IV in um, but uh, as shown by the French study, you may not always need an IV. You can also go for nasal, but, but I, get, um, I, I get the comment. Uh, but I assume we have different type of patients. If a baby is born in severe bradycardia, pale, uh, and without any muscular activity, well, intubate. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. try to find the venous axis. Yeah. Um, but if you have a baby that you see the slowly increasing oxygen needs, uh, despite nasal CPAP, 
and despite uh, your efforts to recruit along, then you may need, may have a little bit more time to do an intubation and a mist procedure or, or uh, in a setting which is a little bit more comfortable for, for the baby also. And you, uh, but I think I've discussed this also in the last le lecture, it's not only the pain, it's also the, the lesions that you may create. So it depends a little bit on uh, also on these aspects that uh, um, yeah. perhaps I, this has my comment is a little bit infested by the fact that in Rotterdam we had to take care, take care of all the tracheal lesions of the full country but it, it happens it happens and it, it exists and it's a major burden for those babies who who have this type of lesions and I have just received a text message Probably this is more of a comment from one of our nurse educators. Should we do an EMLA study for preterm infants? Um, well, there's quite some studies, if I recall well, for um, a heel stick, because that's most commonly used. If you would do an EMLA study, I would suggest to go for lumbar puncture or, or uh, at the, I also think that there are some data on uh, um, pick line placement with, with EMLA, which are neither so conclusive. Actually, I recently summarized all these data because I had to revise a chapter. So if this nurse, if somebody sends me an email, I'm happy to share. But the only thing that I have until now is the Word document. I'm still waiting for the proof print of the text, but I'm happy to share. It may be convenient if he or she wants to have an overview on the available uh, reference on, on that. So if when whoever sends me an email, I'm happy to share yeah. the, the, the documents. Yeah, thank, thank you, Carol. So yeah. Julie, looks like there are no more questions here in the chat box. No, yeah, yeah. you've done very well. Only six minutes over time, well done. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, it's Srini's fault. Anyway, that was fantastic. Um, uh, the nasal administration is very, very exciting. Hopefully. Uh, yeah, yeah, down, it's, it's another route. Down, I mean, even, yeah. even for stem cells, it's done. Eh? So Gosh, it yes. works. It gets into the brain. The, the roots may be a little bit different depending on how you look at it, but it's even for stem cells, it works. So it's, it's a fascinating. Uh, alternative uh, that have to be considered. So Carol, just so, one last question. If at all we want to use one intranasal medicine, you know, for an emergency intubation or whatever, which one would you suggest? Yeah, it's a difficult one. Um, uh, I, I, the only thing that I can refer to is a French study who compared midazolam to ketamine and, and said that both were tolerated well and, um, and that midazolam was a little bit more effective. But again, mm -hmm. I feel discomfortable because yeah. in my experience in children and while well, you should not try this too much on yourself, but it hurts. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so midazolam really is a discomfortable feeling to, to the nose. And as we do not fully understand the mechanism, it's reasonable to assume, assume that the same pattern will exist in neonates um, until we understood better why it's so burning and so uh, distasteful. But I assume it has to do with uh, recept local receptors because I alluded to it's not specific for midazolam, also for the newer uh, benzodiazepines. Okay, okay you, I Carol. think we need to wrap it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank Sorry. you so much. Yeah. Um, all right, so as usual, the recording will be available if I can get the tech right. We have a bit of a break next week. Um, uh, newborn care has to sort out its own internal teaching, <laughs> teaching backlog. So yeah. break from the Zoom session. Um, and if you have any uh, burning questions, email Carol directly. I put up his hotmail sure. email sure. on the chat line. But he's got I, 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 I email usually email reply right. within 48 hours. He doesn't sleep. <laughs> All right. I do, I do. Okay. but at another time compared to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Okay, thanks, thanks everyone for joining and thank you, Shrini and Carol. Um, stay safe, everyone. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Okay. Bye. Bye.